Um, the title is The Rabbis and Their Principles, or for the next time somebody asks why rabbis have authority. I think the first title is a little bit shorter uh, and uh, easier to, uh, <laughs> a little less confrontational, <laughs> as, as my wife just pointed out. Uh, so uh, I think, um, to begin with, uh, we know uh, from Pirkei Avot, as Rabbi Itzakov mentioned, and, uh, and Rabbi Kropkin mentioned, uh, when, when, when the Torah was given at Har Sinai, it was given uh, not just the written part, but there are obviously some parts that had to be transmitted orally. Hashem taught Moshe certain things, and then throughout the rest of the Torah, Moshe teaches the Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel, he teaches those uh, details of those laws. And not just laws, but also concepts and, uh, and, and many other types of things. The fact that we have any kind of halacha or anything like that at all today is not just because of the Torah that was given um, in the written form, but because of the, that same tradition that Moshe taught Yeshua and Yeshua taught the elders and the elders taught the uh, taught the, the prophets, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to wh whoever our great teachers are today. A common thing that happens uh, very often in, in discussions with people who want to know more about Judaism is they say, oh, I believe in God, but the rabbis, uh, they're just men. They're just people just like you and me. I make mistakes. They make mistakes. Who's to say that they have any kind of authority besides uh, any kind of authority that I have. So I think part of the answer to that question that might help people understand this is to know who these rabbis were. But there were a lot of rabbis. So I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, in the, in, this, uh, in the 30 minute class, even the 40 minute class, I wouldn't be able to give you the entire history of all the rabbis in the last 2000 years or more, as you will see in a moment. But if we focus in on just one rabbi, just one rabbi, I think we'll get an idea, and this is, by the way, the, the, the faintest idea, the, a tickle of an idea of what kind of people we're talking about when we talk about the rabbis who passed over on the tradition. And the rabbi I'd like to speak to you about today is none other than Shimon ben Shetach. And you're probably asking, Shimon ben who? And, uh, and yeah, he's not a very well-known rabbi. He, you've, you might have heard of him from a mission in Pirkei Avot that we're going to quote later on today, uh, God willing, in just a few moments. But uh, uh, he's not on every page of the Talmud or anything like that. Uh, I, I do want to share a few stories with him that might get, uh, sort of enlighten you into what kind of a person he is, what kind of a character he had, and even what kind of a character his son had. And he's not even one of the rabbis. So, uh, so, so let's begin. First of all, Shimon ben Shetach was a Tana. A Tana means a rabbi quoted in the Mishnah. So the Mishnah was written in around the year 250 of the Common Era. So about, uh, okay, let's say about 17, 1800 years ago. So until that point, the Mishnah was completely orally transmitted from one person to, to another, completely memorized word for word, and a person could not become, could not get smicha, could not be a rabbi until they could prove that they knew everything basically by heart. They were not even allowed to keep notebooks. Notebooks were, uh, were considered a, a, a cheating device, uh, a cliff notes, or what are they called nowadays? Uh, <laughs> spark notes or whatever, right? Do they still use those? I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so the, the, the first story I'd like to tell you about Rav Shimon ben Shetach, I'm going to call the donkey and the necklace, uh, because it's a, t a story told in the, in the Yerushalmi Talmud. Okay, like I told you, he's not a very well-known rabbi. There aren't too many stories, but one of the stories is in the, in the Yerushalmi, in Bava Metziah 2.5, if you want to look this up. So it describes how Shimon ben Shetach was very poor. He was so poor that he worked in the linen business. How poor was he? So he, he, he worked in shmatas. Right? He worked in the linen business, and he made a very, very, uh, very difficult, uh, uh, very unsuitable living. Now, his students, out of respect to the Rebbe, felt bad that he was so poor. So they decided, they urged him to leave the business and to purchase a donkey. So they purchased, they used, they basically, they made him close his business. They used whatever money was, they, they had from whatever, uh, everything must go sale that he had. Right? 
and, and they purchased a donkey. They purchased a donkey from a non-Jew. Uh, and, uh, and it was discovered after they, after they bought the donkey that the, the original owner, by accident, left a pearl on the donkey. I imagine it as a necklace, but it might have probably not been a necklace. So somewhere in the donkey's fur was a beautiful pearl that the, uh, the original owner didn't notice. And he sold the donkey accidentally together with the actual pearl in it. His students were thrilled that they found this extra treasure because now the teacher could be rich. He'll be rich forever and not have to worry about anything and be able to learn Torah and teach Torah without any considerations for uh, his livelihood. They brought the pearl to their teacher, Shimon ben Shetach, and he asked them if the owner of the donkey knew about the treasure that was still there. They said no. And he said, do you think I'm a barbarian? I bought the donkey, not a pearl at which point he promptly returned the jewel to its rightful owner, and the seller of the donkey was so overwhelmed that he cried out, blessed is the God of Shimon ben Shetach. Just to give you an idea uh, of what, what kind of a principled person he was. Um, he wasn't just a rabbi. Uh, he was also one of the Zugot. So historically, uh, this is a page completely copied out of Wikipedia. The, the Zugot were, a, were five groups of rabbis around the time before the destruction of the, uh, of the second temple. So this is obviously more than 2,000 years ago, right? So uh, if, uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, right there, the third one there, circle, is Simeon ben Shetach, that's Shimon ben Shetach. He, uh, together with Yehuda ben Tab Taba, were both the Zugot. In other words, one was the Av Betin, one was the, uh, the, the main judge, the su Supreme Court Justice, if you will, and the other was the Nasi, or otherwise known as the, uh, the prince or the president of the, the Jewish Confederation, uh, whatever you want to call it. So the, one, one was a, more of a political position, one was more of a, uh, one was a, more of a um, legal position. As one of the Zugot, Shimon ben Shetach, uh, is, is very important historically. He's, uh, it, it, as you can see, the, the last group of, of, of Zugot you probably know best, that was Hillel and Shammai, who, uh, who, who witnessed um, the, the destruction of, of the temple eventually. Um, uh, so approximately this, uh, this occurred, it was around the year, uh, again, 76 to 69, of the, before the Common Era. Shimon ben Shatach is very famous for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Mishnah in Perkei Avot, in the first chapter, the ninth Mishnah. It says there, Shimon ben Shatach Omer, have a marbel lechakor et a'edim. Be very careful about how you cross-examine witnesses. Have a zihir bidvarecha, and be careful in your words. Why? Shema mitocham yumdu l'shaker. It could be that you might teach them to lie. So again, Shimon ben, the son of Shetach, would say, increasingly cross-examine the witnesses, be careful with your words, lest they learn from them how to lie. Now, uh, this wouldn't ordinarily seem like the, the most important uh, thing for him to teach, but it turns out that it was very personal to him, according to at least one commentary on the Mishnah. And that is Rav Avadia ben Yaakov Soforno, who is, again, not very famous for his commentary on the Mishnah, but he is famous for his commentary on the Torah. In his commentary on the Mishnah, he says, Amar kol eile, the reason that Shimon ben Shetach said all of this is l'shamer mema shekara b'inyan b'no, to guard from what happened to his own son. Shana rag b'mitzvot beitin al pi edim. His son was killed through the bet din. And not just any bed, as we'll see from the story, it was actually Shimon ben Shetach himself who was the head of the court. And he killed his own son because of the, witness, the testimony of witnesses. She'idu mipnehem, sha'arog et hanefesh, they witnessed about him that he killed somebody. Ve'edim atzmam hachishu et atzmam besof. And the witnesses would eventually contradict each other in the end. Again, so Shimon ben Shetach said, be very careful about how you cross-examine witnesses. Be very careful with your words. You don't want to teach them how to lie. So the Sephorno says it was a very personal um, uh, mission for Shimon ben Shetach because his own son was killed because of uh, witnesses who were contradicted. Now, what's the story? How did this happen? Why would his son be killed by Shimon ben Shetach himself because of testimony that was false? 
the story goes like this, and it's a it's an involved story. Okay. Um, there's a, a Gemara in the Talmud Bavli in Sanhedrin 45 that discusses this a story where Shimon ben Shetach himself was involved in the hanging of 80 witches, 80 women in Ashkelon, it says. It doesn't say in the, in the Gemara how this happened, but Rashi in the commentary there explains, and it, it tells from the story in the, uh, in the Talmud Yerushalmi in Masechet Chagiga what the details actually were. There were a bunch of witches, and they were dancing, and they were all in this cave, and, uh, and Shimon ben Shetach had to, and of course we know witchcraft is illegal, so Shimon ben Shetach had to come up with some sort of way to, uh, to punish them. So what he did was, in order to trick them, he came on a rainy day together with 80 young men who were each given a jar with a dry cloak in it. He told them that upon hearing his signal, these men should put on those dry cloaks and come into uh, the cave and lift the witches off the ground. Now, the reason to, uh, this is a little bit uh, complicated, and maybe we'll talk about this some other time, but there's an idea that when witches are not touching the ground, when they're not touching something earthy, then they are no longer in control of their magical powers, and then they are able to be, um, then they are able to be uh, uh, stopped from, from using magic. Uh, I know it's complicated, and you have to believe in levitation and things like that, but let's, let, let's take it uh, on, uh, on face value for now. So anyway, so uh, that's not even the story I'm trying to tell you. Uh, anyway, so he tells them upon hearing the signal, they're going to put on these dry cloaks. Shimon ben Shetach called for the witches to open the cave door so that he could enter. When he, uh, when, uh, when he did this, he impressed them by walking in with a dry cloak, and he told them that he came to learn and to teach. Each of the witches immediately started conjuring up parts of a festive meal, and they then in, uh, inquired as to what magic he could do. What is he going to teach them? It's like uh, the the famous uh, the the famous idea that when when Moshe was was doing magic in front of Paro, Paro said, "You're bringing magic into a house of magic. Our whole country can do magic. Children can do your kind of magic tricks. So what what are you going to teach us?" So so each of the witches conjured. Uh, so he offered to make. 80 men appear with dry cloaks who would sweep them off their feet, literally. So giving, giving the signal, the men entered and captured the witches who were taken off and then eventually hanged. The story concludes, right? So, and they were hanged. And, okay, enough with the dancing witches. Now, one problem about all this, witches might have relatives. And indeed, these witches did. So the story concludes that the relatives of those witches who were uh, were angered by obviously by their relatives being killed, and uh, and they were, they were uh, they came forward with false testimony about Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach's son of a capital crime. Now, what what are the details of that crime? That's a different story in the Gemara in Chagiga, and the story goes like this: One day, once upon a time, Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach himself was walking in the field outside the city when he noticed a man running after another man, planning to kill him. He ran after them. Trying to stop them, uh, trying to stop and save the victim, but he was too late. And he got there; the victim was already lying on the ground. "You murderer!" he cried to the to the man. "Why did you th Why did you take the law into your own hands and murder a fellow man? I can't bring you to trial because we know how many witnesses do you need to have to have a uh, a capital case in Judaism. You need to have two witnesses. Thank you. And he was only one witness." But he says, the Almighty who knows the innermost secrets of the heart, he's going to punish whoever willfully takes the life of his neighbor. No sooner than Rabbi Shimon said those words that a huge serpent appeared out of nowhere. The serpent twisted itself around the murderer and strangled him to death. The following day, what did people find when they went out into the field? Two dead people. Not, not realizing the circumstances, the people began to seek the murderer, but he was nowhere to be found. The relatives and friends of the witches now saw their opportunity to get revenge on Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach. Just like witches may have relatives, rabbis may have sons. So, so what ended up happening was they persuaded two of their friends to testify falsely that they saw the son of Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach, right, kill one of the men, and when his companion tried to stop him, he strangled him too. So they basically blamed both deaths on the son of Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach. 
Accordingly, the two plotters appeared before the judges, testified that the son of Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach committed the murders, and we called him to stop, and uh, he, he ran away, and we tried to stop him, we tried to catch him, and he managed to get away from us. The judges, and all of the people were shocked. It was unbelievable that the son of the great Nasi of the Sanhedrin, who was known to be a pious, as pious as his father, should commit such a crime. They issued orders to arrest him. When he appeared in court before the witnesses, they immediately shouted, yes, this is the man that we saw attack this man in the field and kill the other innocent man. Now, Shimon ben Shetak was very sad. He knew the witnesses were false, as he himself had seen the murder. But he was forbidden from saying anything because, again, he was only one witness. And only one witness can't testify alone. So he was, the, uh, so he was stuck in that situation. And he was so, so he said to his son, even if the court should adjudge you to be guilty, I will not allow them to execute the sentence until the truth of this matter comes out. And we're going to investigate. We're going to prove you innocent. It's obviously something that the relatives of the witches are trying to do in order to get revenge on me. But the son replied, no, my dear father. And this is the crux of the story here. Do not delay my trial because people are going to say that you're taking advantage of your high office to save your son. You have to show the world that you observe the Torah to its minutest detail, even when it involves your own flesh and blood. So Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach turned to his son, and he took him to the court for the trial, where the witnesses reiterated their oath that the young man was a killer and that he deserved the death penalty. The evidence was conclusive, and the court, of which Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach himself was the chief judge, found his son guilty of murder, and they sentenced him to death. Until he said the words, if I actually committed the crime that I'm sentenced for, let not, my death let, let not my death atone for my sins. But if I am not guilty of this crime, then let my death atone for all my sins. The witnesses were moved by this the pathetic, sad story that was occurring right in front of their eyes. And they said, stop the execution. We admit that we falsified our testimony. We now desire to withdraw our statement, but we did not see this man commit the crime that he's accused of. Nevertheless, because they actually already testified and the court accepted the, 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 the uh, testimony to not lose face, the court had to kill, had to kill Roshima ben Shetach's son. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what kind of person gives up his life in support of his father's principles? The answer is the son of Atana, the son of a rabbi who's quoted in the Mishnah. This story explains why Shimon ben Shetach told the judges in Pirkei Avot to judge and examine witnesses carefully. But this also demonstrates what kind of people we're talking about when we say the rabbis who transmitted Hashem's Torah leading up to our generation and beyond. 